Hey guys. <sighs> hey, let me tweet this out first, okay? <laughs> These millennials and their social media. It's just... <laughs> I'm like a millennial ate another millennial. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you can continue that while I do the introduction. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. You can find the Commonwealth Club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on the club's YouTube channel. I'm John Zipperer, host of the club's week-to-week -week political roundtable and the vice president of media and editorial, and your moderator for today's program. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Rick Wilson, Republican campaign strategist, columnist for the Daily Beast, and author of the book, Everything Trump Touches Dies. <laughs> Rick Wilson is a seasoned Republican political strategist and self-proclaimed infamous negative ad maker. His regular column with the Daily Beast is a must read in the political community, and he's widely published in the Washington Post, Politico, and The Hill. In Everything Trump Touches Dies, Mr. Wilson brings his dark humor and biting analysis to what he calls the absurdity of American politics in the age of Trump. We're about to hear from a lifelong conservative who says the Republican Party has abandoned its principles. Today we'll talk about that and the future of the country. Please welcome Rick Wilson. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Well, glad to have you here. All right. Now, this book, it's a no-holds-barred takedown of Donald Trump, the Trump administration, and every individual in government, the GOP, the media, and elsewhere who have supported him, whether reluctantly or enthusiastically. Well, they only gave me 100,000 words, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, by page 250, it kind of dawned <laughs> on me that you don't like this guy. Not much. I'm slow, I'm slow. But you've known him for years, or you've known of him I've for years? I've known of him. I've, I've met Donald Trump a few times over the years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I worked for Giuliani in New York, when he was mayor, the impression of Donald Trump of every single person in the city was basically this guy's a fraud, and this guy's a this guy's a joke, and he's you know always looking for the greater fool lender to come down the pike, and when I started to be, grow extremely concerned about Trump in the course of the the election, I went out to see a hedge fund friend of mine in New York, and and I'll clean this up a little bit for our family audience. I said you know we've got to be very careful because if Trump puts his own money into this race, he could, he's a billionaire. He, he, my friend says, wait a minute. With a few more words in between there. <laughs> Donald Trump's not a billionaire. He looks at himself, he goes, I'm a billionaire. Donald Trump is a clown living on credit. <laughs> and it struck me at that moment, the enormity of the fraud we were looking at. Because this guy has always looked for one scam after another, one sucker after another, and Unfortunately, this, this time the mark was the Republican Party and the conservative movement and about 40% uh, of Americans. Well, before we get too deep into your view of Donald Trump and what he has wrought, let's talk about where you came from and how you came to your views. Now, you were born in Tampa, Florida. I was born in Florida, and uh, I'm a fifth-generation Floridian, which is basically like a unicorn. Um, and, you know... Uh, Raised in, a, in an educated family, uh, upper middle class family, and conservative. Could, no, actually, my parents were. My mom was a damn hippie liberal, um, <laughs> and um, and I, I would say that uh, I was raised in a conservative climate, um, but it wasn't. A, a, but my parents were were you know very much civil rights liberals, and so I grew up not thinking of that as a particularly liberal position, mm -hmm. but as a particularly humane and appropriate position, um, and that, uh, and I and I came up in politics working for George H. W. Bush and for you know a lot of people who now are are would be viewed in this Republican Party as people that were to the left of Ted Kennedy. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there was a certain fundamental decency about how we approach people and a certain degree where we played very, very hard politics and we didn't take a lot of prisoners, but we were also, um, you know, mindful of the progress of this country on some very meaningful areas, civil rights in particular, the, the environment in, in, in particular, that was precious and we didn't want to see it walked back or rolled back or destroyed, unfortunately. You know, we're now in an era where all the works of the past must be torn down. I mean, th this week the, 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 the president is proposing to eliminate the Intermediate uh, Forces Treaty, which, 
you know, that noted liberal extremist Kenyan Muslim sleeper agent Ronald Reagan uh, signed with Gorbachev to reduce the, the threat of nuclear war in, in Europe. So you know, that has to be torn down now because it's an artifact of, of the non-Trumpian past. We've got to have year zero on everything. Mm -hmm. What was your year zero for seeing that you wanted to get into government, get into politics? I mean, were, was, did Reagan inspire you? or? Well, you know, like a lot of kids um, I, who were teenagers during Carter, mm -hmm. there was a perception that the country was drifting and weak. And, you know, you, you, you may not be sophisticated enough to know it when you're 13 years old that a part of this is because Nixon, you know, basically blew up all the institutional norms in Washington. But you start to realize, and when you're that age, you, 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 you prefer leadership. And, you know, I was also a nerd kid, so I was already reading, um, you know, political history at that point in my, in my youth. And I was interested in the profiles of leadership of presidents who were both optimistic um, and, and, and who had a meaningful impact in, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. And so Reagan did appeal to a, to a young guy like that. He was my first vote when I turned 18 in, uh, in 1984. I cast my first, my first vote was for Ronald Reagan. Um, and, and as a conservative, my views on, on particularly on things like individual liberty yeah. and free markets, you know, throughout school, I was at George Washington in the, in the 80s, and it was a hotbed of, you know, guys who were go, ready to go out and be the last generation of cold warriors. And, you know, we looked at in, in you know, in the, in the fall of 83, when I got to GW, we were in the absolute depths of the Cold War. It couldn't, couldn't have gotten any more icy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was KAL 007. That was the, you know, the, 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 the we, we now know it was the death gasp of the, of the communist empire, but it certainly didn't feel that way at the time. So that, you know, inspired me on the, in terms of, of, of believing that we had to have a country that was strong in the world and that had effective leadership in the world. Um, and in terms of, of appreciating the Constitution and free markets and individual liberty and the rule of law, I, I look at those things as, you know, as nonpartisan questions. Mm -hmm. I look at them as things that, it, that people from every part of the political spectrum can embrace because our founders built a pretty cool machine that while it had its flaws in the beginning, it's got some good self-correcting mechanisms and it's managed to survive over 200 years as a, as an, as a going concern through some pretty terrible things. I mean, we, we, we overcame a civil war and we overcame a Great Depression and we overcame Milli Vanilli and we're going to overcome Donald Trump in the end because the country's got a fundamentally robust ecosystem that keeps us afloat. So the type of conservative you are and the type of Republican mm -hmm. you are, um, we've heard from other never Trumpers who have been here, mm -hmm. uh, David Frum, Charlie Sykes, both kind of come to the realization that they thought that they were the majority in the party and they came to realize they were a thin veneer on the party, that mm -hmm. th this, this populist feeling and, and this disgruntlement and the lack of attachment to these uh, principles that have been argued out in the Federalist Society and, and all these other conservative organizations right. had meant nothing to them. Well, we've learned that, and, and that's been part of the sort of shock and awe of Trumpism mm -hmm. for people who you know, have a room temperature or greater IQ in the Republican Party. <laughs> this, this idea that the people that go to a Trump rally want to talk about Hayek um, and want to talk about free markets, they don't give a damn about that stuff. They have a bundle of anxieties and resentments that's being fed every day by Fox. Um, you know, they, they have this, this enormous anger mm -hmm. with the educated part of the party. They look at it as something that's held them back or held them down or hurt them or belittles them in some way. And that old model of the GOP, the, the tripod, where you had social conservatives, you had foreign policy conservatives, mm -hmm. national security of foreign policy conservatives, and you had economic and individual liberty conservatives. That balance used to keep any particular faction from becoming too powerful. And so, you know, the guys like me in the, in the economic and foreign policy side would keep a check on the social conservatives. And the social conservatives would keep a check on the economic conservatives to not be too much of a bunch of hard <laughs> um, But that's all gone now. 
there is only one pillar of the Republican Party today, and that's Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So the, the party that produced Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush and Jack Kemp and John McCain and a whole host of other people who had a view of the world that that was nuanced and had a view of the world that that spanned an entire area of, of conservative thought in different degrees and, and different flavors, it's all gone. It's all been replaced by, do you love the dear leader enough? Will you sacrifice for the, for the Donald enough? And because of that, the party is, is, they've gambled everything on whether Donald Trump is going to be, you know, verbally incontinent two days before the election and blow up their entire, their, their entire strategy. They recognize that they're one tweet away from disaster at any given moment. Mm -hmm. But they're also terrified of his base. They're terrified of the people that support him. They live in absolute abject terror. If you guys ever wonder why, why aren't more Republicans standing up and fighting back against Donald Trump? I will tell you exactly why. Because the minute they do, their Facebook pages and their Twitter feeds and their voicemails fill up with the most vile, horrifying death threats you've ever imagined. I have a member of Congress who's a friend who right after the election was doing a town hall meeting and he was asked by a guy stands up, he says, are you going to support Mr. Trump 100% of the time? And he says, well, I'm going to support the president when the president does things that are right for our district. I represent you. I don't represent Donald Trump. And the guy insists, are you going to support Mr. Trump 100% of the time? And he said, you know, I knew he was popular, but I didn't, nah, I didn't know it was going to be the disaster. He says, no, no, I'm not going to support him 100% of the time. I'm going to support him when he's right. I'm going to work with him when he's right to do things for our district. And this is not some flaming liberal social justice warrior. This is a guy who's from a decently red seat. By the time he got off the stage, his kids' social media pages had threats on them saying things like, you better tell your dad he better stick with Mr. Trump or, he'll, or you'll grow up without a daddy. And his wife's firm, his wife's business got calls that morning. You better fire her because we're going to boycott you and do all these things. And the death threats they got were ridiculous. And I've fought a lot of races against Democrats. I've taken y'all's lunch money a lot. And there've only been, and I've run some ads that really piss people off. There have been a couple of times where I've gotten a death threat I thought was credible, where I thought was like, I better call the PD about this one. Since 2015, you know, I, in a state where I can, I carry a gun for a reason. I've had enough threats. My kids have had enough threats. My wife's had enough threats. My dogs and cats have had enough threats. These people are bonkers and they feel unhinged by Donald Trump and they feel liberated to do this sort of thing. And this is why the projection you're hearing from Donald Trump about mobs is out there. This is why Republicans are saying, oh, the Democratic mob, the violent Democratic Antifa. Well, the people that are carrying torches and calling for black people to be put back in chattel slavery are not a bunch of Democrats that I noticed. They're people who supported Donald Trump 100% of the time. So, you know, that sort of, that sort of uh, atmosphere that's built up inside the party now Trump has you know, what the Russians would call Zampolit, their political enforcers by threat of violence. Uh, you really answered my next question, which was to get to Donald Trump. Uh, well, not just what the problem is with him that he's wrought with the party, but what the problem is with the, de the Republicans and the conservatives who go along with him and say it's for the Supreme Court. Right. It's, you know, what about that? You essentially have three categories of Republicans right now who support Donald Trump. First category, it's a narrow, narrow band. They're the opportunists. They're the smart guys. They're the Mitch McConnells, okay? They want to accomplish certain meta policy goals, and they know if they kiss the ring enough and he lets them alone, they can do them. That's why Mitch McConnell was the president who appointed Brett Kavanaugh. It wasn't Donald Trump. That was entirely a McConnell show, which is why the, which is why the nomination was always going to pass, because it wasn't dependent on Trump. It was all McConnell's guile. Okay, and he's very, very good at his work. Um, so those opportunists are out there. It's Lindsey Graham, Matt Gates, those guys, they're all playing a game to either accrue power in Congress or money for their, for their campaigns in the future or stature with Fox News. So those, the, the opportunists are a fairly small number. There's a much larger number of people who I referred to previously who are scared to death. 
They, it's the FOMT crowd, fear of mean tweets. FOMT is what guides all these guys. They're terrified he will tweet, Congressman John Smith may be a Republican, but I hate him. He doesn't want to MAGA. And then that guy's going to live in witness protection for the rest of his life. The third category, it's actually a lot smaller than you think. Uh, it, it's the real true believers. And in, in the House, there are maybe 50 of them, 40 or 50 of them. In the Senate, there's maybe 10 of them who actually believe in the Trump nationalist populist <laughs> and they buy into it from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, that group may shrink a little bit in the next couple of weeks because um, a lot of the guys in the scared group are going to disappear. And, and the remainders are going to say, was this such a good bet after all? Because even though the Democrats structurally were almost never going to win the Senate, it just structurally wasn't going to happen. They only had eight Republican target seats this year. Um, they are going to win the House. It's, it's going to be narrow, but they're going to win the House. They only need 24. 24 is the magic number. It's you know, 24 and it's Pelosi. That's it. You need, you know, that, that's the only number you need. And the Republicans have to catch every break between now and Election Day. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these guys know that the party's about to stop. The music's almost going to, the music's going to stop soon. And, you know, in Washington, the last thing you want to do is be without a chair when the music stops. <laughs> you, you, you seem confident about the Democrats taking the House. Um, with the polls that I've been looking at, and certainly nothing compared to, I'm sure, the, all the info you have, but polls I've been looking at show you know, a still sizable but shrinking enthusiasm gap, if you will, of Democrats. Republicans apparently were supercharged by the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, what are some of the factors that come into play? We talked uh, here at the club last night about millennials voting or Hispanics voting or not sure. voting. What do you think will be the key well, decision makers? Well, let me say this first off, and I tell Democrats this a lot. I mean this with love, y'all. <laughs> Democrats are holistically bad at politics. They chase every damn rabbit out there and they cannot stay on target for their lives. This entire caravan issue, that is Trump bait. He threw that out there and of course, the Democrats crawled all over it and therefore the news media starts covering it and it gives Fox News something to say every night that the Bin Laden family is creeping toward the border to murder you with their Mexican MS-13 allies <laughs> and stoke the Republican base into a frenzy. So. You know, the, the fact that this election has been nationalized, mm -hmm. Republicans are, are head faking to the Democrats. Oh, this is great for us. We love this. Uh, if it was great for them, they wouldn't have already abandoned 35 Republican House seats. They've cut these guys loose. They're done. They're now defending in the B tier of people who are in R plus seven, eight, nine seats. They're not playing offense. You know, Charles Cook came out today with 10 new seat changes, mm -hmm. eight of which were Democratic direction. They were Republican seats that went from lean Republican to toss up or from likely Republican to lean Republican. And one Democratic seat that moved from, uh, from likely to lean, or lean to likely, excuse me. Uh, and so it just was, it's not this, this idea that the blue wave is completely dissipated is mistaken. Those things are baked in the cake already. And look, a lot of people on the Republican side were motivated by the Kavanaugh thing because it got wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Fox for three consecutive weeks. It became something that was that was a unifying thing outside of Trumpism for Republicans, the feeling of uh, the media is treating us badly. Um, uh, you know, as juvenile as that is. Um, but let's also see the flip side of this coin. In 2016, Republican women got a trial separation from the party. And all through 17, the divorce proceedings were going on and we saw in all the special elections that Republican women had basically moved to the independent category and were casting their, they, they'd moved to I in terms of their identification, but they were casting votes for Democrats. Mm -hmm. I think Ed Gillespie got his <laughs> handed to him in Virginia. He's a moderate Republican. Hell, he's to the left of me. And, and he was a glove fit for Virginia, but Trumpism, was poison for female voters in Virginia. You've seen the same thing over and over and over again in these special elections. And I'll, I'll wrap yeah. this up real quick. A lot of groups that people think are gonna come out in great numbers are not, okay? Stop thinking millennials are gonna save you. They're not going to save you. You know what, it's gonna maybe be instead of 23%, 25%. Even Barack Obama only juiced him about five points. 
And that was a landslide. That was an epic moment. Mm -hmm. So millennials are not going to be the, the be all and end all to fix politics for the Democrats in America. Um, they're going to help. They're certainly all identifying as Democrats now. There's no cohort. I mean, when I was growing up, when I was the, when I was the age of millennials, it was basically kind of a 65-35 split, Democrat-Republican. Now it's like a 95-5 to split, Democrat to Republican, uh, among younger voters. Uh, Hispanic voters are going to come out not in as big a numbers as, as Democrats had hoped, perhaps, because they, again, suck at politics holistically, and they're not good at addressing things beyond, you know, they... The identity politics cliches mm -hmm. of, oh, all they care about is immigration. You know what Hispanics care about more in polling than I've done all over the country? Education. By far. It's way up here for, for Hispanic voters. And the Democrats never give them the answers they're looking for. It's always, you know, uh, you're the oppressed minority. We're going to take care of you by fixing the immigration system. A lot of these people, they care about immigration. It affects their lives very directly. But they care about education and jobs more. So, you know, I don't know, read the polls once in a while, might help. <laughs> a question from the audience. It shows you we're not all San Francisco liberals here. If Trump is so terrible, how do you explain his success? The economy, Supreme Court, et cetera. Well, President McConnell has been very successful in naming two Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and Vice President off. Paul Ryan. And, and Vice President Paul Ryan. Um, the economy, you know, when this economy was doing exactly what it's doing right now, when it was Barack Obama, I criticized it because the economy has held afloat on a gigantic bubble of Fed equity, of zero interest loans to Wall Street. They held, after, the, after the 2008 economic collapse, the Fed stepped in and they inflated the economy. That bubble is still underneath this economy. It is still keeping us afloat. There have been no meaningful legislative accomplishments of Donald Trump on the economy at all. These manufacturing jobs that were coming along, they were coming along in the end of Obama's term. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't you know, emerge sui generis because, you know, or, or de novo rather, from Trumpism because Donald Trump says, uh, you know, I don't like the swamp. There have been no, there's been nothing truly accomplished. The regulatory fixes he's done have actually been so narrowly crafted because they're payoffs to the coal industry and the steel industry. Um, and those things have been almost tuned to support individual corporations a lot of the stuff he's talking about is, of course, as you know, completely false. When he comes out and says, we're opening 20 new steel plants in this country and a million people are going to be working in them. Well, it's one that had planned to reopen under Obama and it's employing 40 more people. It's not this, this is a, this bubble of fantasy of Trump's accomplishments is just that it's a bubble and it's, 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 it's great pitching and, and nothing there. It's all hat and no cattle. You also target the tax bill from a conservative point of view. Absolutely. In the book. Tell us why that was not a conservative. I mean, it had a lot of things that people thought were long sought conservative val uh, goals, but you say no. They weren't long sought conservative goals, actually. They were long sought corporate goals. And as an actual economic conservative, I believe that if you're going to pass a tax cut, it should go beyond about 150 guys on Wall Street and about 65 billionaires in this country getting 85% of the benefit of the bill. I don't believe in crony capitalism. I don't believe in the government picking winners and losers. You know what we picked in this tax bill? We picked the hedge fund industry. They were the big winners. They won and they won big. And the bill was built in with all these phony predicates, one of which was, oh, the bill will instantly cause economic growth forever to be somewhere around 5%. Oh, really? Now, how's that working out? It's not. Right now, we're going to end up in the two-point-something, three-point-something range if things continue to go well. This has already blown a trillion-dollar hole in the budget. I'm sorry. I had this thing when I signed up for the GOP that fiscal probity was part of the whole game plan, that we weren't going to spend money like drunken sailors. Mm -hmm. um, so this bill is, is, even if you factor in, and we could argue this all day, supply-side effects of the bill and stimulative effects of the bill— you still can't make it work financially over time. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the bait that was thrown out there, this middle class tax cut, it's gonna help. It's de minimis. I'm sorry, if our country's economic core is hedge funds on Wall Street, it's a really different country than I think we're looking for to survive in the next century. These are, these are guys right now who have been given 
a gigantic amount of Federal Reserve money to play with for a decade, and they've played nicely. They've made a ton of money. Um, and now they've give, been giving a gigantic tax break underneath it. They've been given another ton of money. And guess what's going to happen when the drunken sailor party ends and they wake up like that morning in Tijuana where you wake up somewhere, don't know where you are, and your eyes are glued shut, and you're like, I'll never drink tequila again. We're going to have to bail them out again in a couple of years. You mark my words, he will bail them out again. And we're out of money. We're out of tricks. If the economy goes south tomorrow, you know what the Federal Reserve has in the till now? Nothing. The only game they have left is a gigantic inflationary money print. And that, again, as a conservative, I don't know. It didn't really work out during the Great Depression all that well. So I think we need to be very cautious about this tax bill or replicating its effects. Okay. You devote a large part of your book to describing the people who have fallen victim to the curse of everything t Trump touches dies. Let's talk about some of them. Let's start with uh, Steve Bannon. Well, <sighs> imagine cancer with legs. <laughs> Steve Bannon is one of the darkest, and I, I use this word advisedly. Steve Bannon is one of the darkest and most evil people in American politics. If we were a sensible country, Steve Bannon would be horsewhipped in the street because he is, an inf he is a, a racial arsonist he is seeking to overturn the republic and replace it with an authoritarian nationalist populist state. Um, he's walking treason. And, and he's a, one of the most loathsome human beings I've ever encountered in any context whatsoever. And the fact that Steve Bannon targeted my kids to get at me, um, he should hope we never meet in a dark alley. Let's just put it that way. You do take delicious satisfaction in working against Bannon oh, in yes. that infamous Roy Moore uh, Senate campaign in Alabama. Tell our audiences about that. So I've worked against two Democrats in my career. One was Donald Trump. Two, <laughs> against two Republicans. Republicans. Oh, excuse me. Oh, God, it's like 400 Democrats. Sorry. <laughs> um, two Republicans in my career. One was Donald Trump and one was Roy Moore. And I would have done the Roy Moore race pro bono because I heard Steve Bannon had gone all in, put everything, every scrap of his credibility into the race, and I thought, oh my God, he's actually dumber than I thought. He's gonna bet his power with the Mercers and with Trump on a child molester. So I took my superpower, which is making terrible negative ads that people go, I can't believe I saw that on TV, and then they go out and vote the way I want them to. <laughs> um, against Roy Moore, and I gotta tell you, that was like having the greatest hot shower of my life. <laughs> I, I could not have been happier to do that. I mean, there, there, it's rare in politics when you get to do the right thing and screw your enemy to the wall. And Steve Bannon's hide is tacked up on the barn out behind the house right now because he lost everything at that. You know why is Steve Bannon running around Europe trying to rev up like low rent right wing Hitler right parties? Because the Mercers cut off his, sorry. My mother's watching this. So Is she? Okay. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I have that mm, famously, famously salty. <laughs> um, they cut off Steve Bannon at the knees um, or above. Uh, <laughs> and he's running around now trying to, to, to revive his reputation as this, um, as this mastermind of nationalist populism. But he's an evil human being. And, and, you know, a, a healthy political system would purge him. A healthy political system would not have him within a billion miles of, 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 its, of its institutions of power, its influential people, its conferences, its meetings. And yet there is Steve Bannon. He is playing a part of the, of the, the, the death of the GOP by helping to transform it into this nationalist populist party. Even Trump himself last night finally broke the seal came out and said in Texas, oh, I'm a nationalist, I'm a nationalist. Well, that's an old song, we know how it ends, we've seen it over the last 150 years, over and over again. Nationalism is not patriotism, nationalism is not conservatism, nationalism is not even populism. Nationalism is a tool, a gateway drug for authoritarian statism that leads to people being stacked up like cordwood in camps, and it never ends well. So that's, that's, what, that's Steve Bannon's great triumph in Trumpism, and it's also, I think, last night we're going to look back in history, that moment he declared openly he was a nationalist, beyond even Charlottesville. 
which was a moral low point for any president in our history. Um, I think I think the, the the full embrace of nationalism by Trump last night was something that we're going to look at as a an inflection point in this country, where uh, people are going to have to make a call, and they're going to have to make a call very soon about what side they're on. Are they on the side of the republic, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, or Independents, or do they favor something new and dark? And unfortunately, it may be a new and dark thing in America, but it's something we've seen in the world, in Bosnia and in Germany and in Italy and in Cambodia and in Rwanda. And and it never ends the way they want it to end. Is it fair to say more so than Trump's betrayal of conservative views, uh, more than his as what he's doing to the Republican Party, that at the core is what's driving you against him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I, I don't think anyone of goodwill um, from any political perspective wants to see the republic fall and be replaced by authoritarianism a left or right and, and authoritarianism left or right is anathema to what I believe America represents and what America can and should be mm -hmm. and and you know we've always had this sort of broad homeostatic political system in our country right never gets control for too too long or too too much left never gets control for too too long of too too much and we don't always get what we want we play back and forth that was what the founders designed they designed a beautiful tension in our system they designed a, a government that had three co-equal branches. They designed a system that re, that limited executive power and that limited legislative power and limited judicial power. They had these careful lanes and balances. And we're at the point where the enthusiasms of the crowd and the mob are going to replace that if we're not extraordinarily careful as a country. You, you get at that in the book, of course, about that there are certain Republicans right now who are making law and policies as if Democrats will never again be in power, sure. won't control Congress, won't be in the, sure. the White House. Um, it'll be a long time before they control the Supreme Court. But, um, but that, like you're saying, that, that was the core understanding of even when you do have massive power mm -hmm. to understand that, sooner or later you're not going to. So you, you have that in your mind right. when you're making it. And is it because these people are caught up in the fever dream of having the power or because within the White House, as you describe in the book, so many of them have no experience whatsoever oh, in government. Guys, this is like rounding, rounding up 15 people off the street and saying, okay, you're going to go run the space station. <laughs> One or two might have heard of the space station. <laughs> None of them are aeronautical engineers. Um, the White House is stocked right now with people who would never have gotten an interview with George H.W. Bush in the White House. They would never have gotten an interview with George W. Bush or Barack Obama or Bill Clinton's White House. These, these people are, are the tailings, the flotsam of the, the, of, of the Republican Party. It's like, a friend of mine said this to me, he goes, if you made a list of the 10 biggest <laughs> you can think of in the party, are they all working at the White House right now? I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And these people are not... They, they combine incompetence with the fact that they're on this Lord of the Flies, Donald Trump Island reality TV show every day. And so the fights inside, let's put it this way, there were a lot of tensions inside the George W. Bush White House. There were competing groups. There were people who liked each other and didn't like each other. And the same thing happened in the Obama administration and the, and the Clintons and, the, and George H.W. Bush and Reagan and Carter and everything. These people are an order of magnitude more horrible as human beings. All these leaks you see coming out of the White House constantly, it is because 90% of their bandwidth is dedicated to screwing the guys they hate, not to serving the country. So you combine incompetence, malice, stupidity, and indifferent educations, and you've got the, the Trump White House. Also, you have a, a, a guy with the attention span of a gnat um, who who does not focus every day, who does not think that things like the law and the Constitution bind him to behave in any way, and who is fed a constant diet of, you were the great glorious leader, you were the sun king, and we end up with a White House. We should be grateful as a country we have yet to face an actual foreign policy crisis or economic crisis. Because when you can't just blame cast and talk about the swamp, the liberal media, or, or, or crooked Hillary, um, things are going to get ugly fast. 
and you know no one wants a terrorist attack on this country no one wants an economic collapse but you know more presidents than not have had one of those things happen no one wants a natural disaster more presidents than not have had these things confront them and this is a man spectacularly unable to confront these kind of things because he is not externally directed he's internally directed about his ego and his his petty needs well then continuing with the list of people in his orbit and their suffering I actually, I have some other names, but I want to throw in someone and see if they might be an exception to the everything Trump touches dies uh, rule. What about Defense Secretary James Mattis? What do you think? Well, I love me some Jim Mattis, and you guys should every day, for whatever religion, creed, or spiritual practice you follow, get to your knees or look to the heavens and say, please, Lord, Zenu, Buddha, don't let Jim Mattis quit today. Because Jim Mattis is basically running his own foreign policy and defense policy out of the out of the Pentagon He keeps the president as much at arm's length as he possibly can I have constitutional reservations about it But as an American, I'm relieved every day that a man who's not um, an, an evil man-child is running the the, the uh, defense department um, He's taken a lot of hits though. He's taken a lot of damage and he's he's you know This is a man who was universally respected in Washington and there are an awful lot of people in the Trump White House, John Bolton and his mustache, are both trying <laughs> to take out Mattis every day. Every day they're working to, t to, drop down, to, to drop down the hammer on Jim Mattis and get him fired. And, that's, uh, the, and it's not even subtle. Mm. I mean, Bolton doesn't really do subtle. Um, <laughs> but you know, it is certainly something that we should, we should be very mindful that there are only a couple of adults left in the room. Um, is Stephen Miller one of them? I write about Stephen Miller a little bit in the book. And a fun fact that Stephen Miller and Richard Spencer were together at Duke. Richard Spencer, the white nationalist, they were, they, they were at Duke together. And all I can think of is like Stephen Miller sitting in Richard Spencer's room, high as hell, talking about how they're gonna you know, restore the white purity of the Rodina. Um, the guy is just a, he is a creepy individual of the highest order. I mean, Stephen Miller looks like he's got a collection of skin suits in his basement. <laughs> and, and for somebody so young, the malice inside of him to do the, 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 the horrifying cruelty theater of putting children in cages to accomplish a political end, I'm sorry, that ain't the Republican Party I signed up for, okay? That's not the country I signed up for. That is a person who, again, looks at a, he's disguising his white nationalist impulses um, by pretending it's about immigration. It's not about immigration. If there were 7,000 Canadians marching down here tomorrow, you know what would happen? Nothing. It is because Stephen Miller, whatever's broken in Stephen Miller's head, um, whatever's wrong with Stephen Miller, he has an animus toward immigrants and an animus toward brown people that is, that is un inappropriate for anyone working in the White House or in government. Kellyanne Conway's husband apparently has the freedom to tweet against uh, the president. Kellyanne Conway, on the other hand, is his strongest defender out in the media. What do you make of her? No, she just has no shame. Okay. Uh, um, so I've worked in politics for 30 years, and Kellyanne had a niche specialty, which was female voters. Great. Everybody needs a specialty. I'm a bad guy for negative ads. She, that's her specialty. But no one thought, hey, we got to have Kellyanne Conway. It's not because she's a woman. It's because she's Kellyanne. Um, no one thought we had to put Kellyanne Conway in the center of every single discussion in major campaigns. She just wasn't that person. She got into the Trump world, and she realized that in a world of shamelessness, in a world where, you, where, where being a pathological liar is, is not exceptional, it's a minimum qualification, um, that she was actually good at that on TV and she's you know good at blustering and good at, 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 at bellowing The weird thing is you talk to people around the White House. She has no defined job She doesn't do anything in the White House She waits for the phone call to ring and you know for for Jake Tapper or Brian Stetler or, or whoever to have her on the air so that she can open her lie hole for five minutes <laughs> and 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 defend the president he loves that uh, One who got away Sean Spicer Who? Um, look, Sean Spicer looked like a guy who was blinking out the word torture 
from the podium <laughs> in Morse code every day because he hated it so much. The guy was miserable. Sean wasn't from the Trumpy side of this thing. He was a pretty procedural DC guy, good comms guy, you know, nuts and bolts. Not, not you know, Sean's not evil. He just let himself get, you know, wrapped up in that thing. And, you know, Priebus brought him into the White House. And, you know, when the first day the president is screaming that the guy doesn't have a good suit, you're like, oh, okay. You want him to lie that there were 47 trazillion people on the, on the mall, but you're worried about his suit. You could tell Sean Spicer day one was a dead man walking. <laughs> My book sold better. Um, you've worked for a lot of Republicans, as you've pointed out, including Rudy, Rudy Giuliani. Now he is Donald Trump's TV lawyer. Um, do you talk with him? Is he the same oh, no. Rudy Giuliani? He is, he, I haven't spoken to Rudy in quite a while now, for reasons that may be obvious. Um, but I will say this, and I, I know Rudy has a, a very mixed perception in the public. I went to work for him in his 1997 re-election race for mayor, where he had turned the city fundamentally around in terms of jobs and the economy and public safety. And th there were some rough things that, about that. But the analogy that I used at the time, and I still sort of think of today, Rudy was Batman, okay? Batman sometimes does some ethically shady stuff. Batman sometimes works outside the boundaries of the normal things. But he's working for, for the broader good and security. That was the Rudy I knew. And the Rudy that on 9-11, when there was no other leadership in the country for a few hours, when he stood there and spoke extemporaneously about what was going on and what they were doing and how they were trying to save the city, mm -hmm. if Rudy at that moment had dropped down dead, he would have been a national hero that we would have talked about for generations. And unfortunately, what he has done at this point in his career is entered Trump's orbit and all those other things will now be footnotes. And what will be remembered is this horrifying performative TV lawyer act um, in defense of an indefensible man. And I, I, it, it saddens me tremendously. There are a lot of like Rudy alumni mm -hmm. um, that I've talked to over the last several months and all of us are just speechless and hurt and you can't, it's hard to believe what has happened to him, but it has, and we have to face the fact that it has, and it is the corruptive and corrosive influence of Donald Trump. Okay. Um, another question from the audience. Do you agree with Tom Nichols and other never Trumpers that Democrats need to win the next two elections to destroy Trumpism and affecting the GOP? Well, hell, I would take um, a Republican majority if they didn't act like a bunch of junior managers at a Trump golf course. I mean, I would love a Republican Party that would stand up and, and do their constitutional duty and uphold their oath of office, which is to be a co-equal branch of government. Mm -hmm. But they have decided that they work for Donald Trump, that they're his employees, not his peers, and that they are his servants, not his masters. And so I think we've reached the point where the only way we will have accountability for this president is if you have a Democratic majority. Now, do I love the policy outcomes from that as a conservative? No. Do I think Nancy Pelosi is actually going to get anything done and passed? No. The noise problem versus the signal problem here is what we have to face. The signal problem is that Donald Trump was fundamentally compromised by engagement with Russia, that Donald Trump is running an extraordinarily corrupt or, uh, administration. I mean, more corrupt, more lavishly corrupt. It makes Grant look, <laughs> look like George W. Bush. I mean, it, it, this, there's no degree to which these people won't sink to sell favor and influence in this country. I mean, uh, we talked about this with the tax bill briefly. The coal industry basically submitted a menu with prices on it, and they gave Donald Trump the money to get they, what they wanted done for each of the things they wanted done. I, 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 there, there, there are people who have already gotten you know, the, the first scorching. There are a lot of them who should burn. There are a lot of people who should be in jail because of the corruption of this administration. So I don't think you're gonna get that with Devin Nunez, the Fredo of the GOP, um, covering up for this president. And, 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 and these guys, for partisan ends, looking away from a Russian 
intelligence and influence operation that seeks to this very moment to destroy our republic. It is a form of war in the modern era. Short, I mean, it's, it's, it's to the left of the boom, but it is still a form of war, and they look away from it to protect Donald Trump politically. Uh, on that line, um, someone from the audience asked, if Robert Mueller has a smoking gun, if he's got some conclusive mm -hmm. thing, he releases it, um, do you think Republicans will go along no. with... I can, I'll, just, I'll, st I'll just get you right there. No. Yeah. Now, the magic number is in the Senate. You need two-thirds. You ain't getting there. Not before 2020. It's gonna, it, would take, it would take something so extraordinary and so damning that I can't imagine it wouldn't have leaked already for, for a majority of Republicans in the Senate, or not a majority, a, a sufficient number of Republicans in the Senate to, to uh, vote to impeach, and uh, to convict, rather. Mm. I mean, the impeachment is not as, as dubious as the, as the conviction. The impeachment's very difficult, but the conviction is extraordinary. It's, a, it's an order of magnitude higher. Mm -hmm. um, someone asks, who owns Trump? Russians, Saudis, others? Who doesn't? The guy's, the, I, I hate to be sexist and everything, but the guy's got a short skirt and basically it's, hey guy, I want a date. He is not a guy who, who for a moment looks away from money. Everything in his head is always about that one scorekeeping mechanism that he inherited from his defective relationship with his father, which is, are you, are you making the bank? They, this is a guy whose venality is so unbelievably evident every single day. So yes, the Russians did a ton of business with the Trumps, a ton of business. And you know, these were stories we were pitching in 2015 to all those liberal reporters, and they would say things like, oh, well, get to me after the primary. It might be interesting later. And then, during the general, we're pitching the same reporters. And it's like, eh, you know, Hillary's going to win. It's okay. Don't worry about it. We won't follow that money. It's too hard. Too complicated. Well, that stuff is emerging. The, a lot of that data is out there. Mueller's putting that case together. Um, the president and his sons are lying when they say they have no business with Russia or Russians. Um, the Chinese, obviously... And the Saudis obviously have um, become an ATM machine for the Trump family and the Trump family enterprises and businesses, including Jared. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, I think, you know, uh, I think Donald Trump has owned, he's, he's got many masters. Will Trump win in 2020? Well, I have some tough love for y'all now. If it's Bernie or Elizabeth, Trump's going to be president. I'm just going to tell you right now. Democrats need something that they're not that they're not thinking through right now. Right now, Democrats have a scorekeeping mechanism for for presidential nominees. It looks something like this: ideological match. So that means are they right with you on guns, abortion, health care, whatever? Okay. Then you look at can you put it together, raise the billion dollars, raise the money, do the campaign operational things, etc. Then it's can we get through the super delegate mess and all the Democratic internal blah, blah, blah? Got it backwards. The last thing Democrats have on their thing is charisma and engagement with the media. That should be way up here. They should look for a candidate who can be great on television. That's where this election is going to be fought. It's not going to be fought out in caucuses and in, and in, and in policy debates. It's going to be fought out of who's got the charisma to go kick Donald Trump's ass up and down the block every single day. Now, if that's Bernie, who is 9,000 years old, <laughs> and who's going to go out and say, the millionaires and billionaires, <laughs> it's not going to work. It's just, the, 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 it's just not going to be there. Uh, Elizabeth Warren may have many shining merits, but I think last week, you know, that whole thing went over like a fart in a hurricane. Um, and, and I don't think she's particularly great at politics. It's someone else. That's not me. Somebody's on the list. Well, and I know it's not your, but, it's literally not your job to give the Democrats right. advice, but do you see Republicans who could do that kicking up and down the street of Trump? Look, I think that there are, I think that the Democrats need somebody who's a little bit out of left field. I think that the, the, a lot of the lineup right now is, is, a little pedestrian and a little dull. 
And I'm just going to say this, and here we go. I'm gonna be, mm. For the love of God, if you know Hillary Clinton, ask her to shut her damn mouth. <laughs> you know what she should be doing? Raising money behind closed doors. She's great at it. But every time she's on TV, it reminds every one of those Trump voters that, that why they voted for him. A lot of Republicans who are not Trump fans were just slightly less fans of Hillary. They, their hatred was just a little higher. And I don't think she does any good for the Democratic Party moving forward. They are, I mean, look, what else do you use from the 1990s? You still have your flip phone? No. And, and, the, and the Clintons now are a dated product. And politics is about novelty in a lot of ways. Trump was a novel candidate. He was a new th flavor. He was something exciting and different and transgressive. So I, I would recommend to the Democrats, you know, don't feel like the it's my turn person needs to be the person. Look at who, you, who can be a great fighter against Donald Trump and who's great on television. That's where, that's where the battle will be fought. It will not be fought on policy questions. I know that people, I, I know people want the policy to be the, like the way you make decisions and that maybe that would be a more robust democracy and a more robust, robust republic. But, you know, P.J. O'Rourke once famously said the three branches of government are money, television, and <laughs> Now, which one of those is Donald Trump great at? All three. I would suggest the Democrats look for somebody who's great at at least one of those. Uh, someone asks uh, about if uh, everyone could turn off their phones or other <laughs> loud noise-making devices, husbands, etc. cetera. Um, on the Republican side, any chance of, you know, John Kasich or someone else who sure. could challenge? Sure, sure, and, the, and the, uh, you know, look, when Pat Buchanan got in the primary against George H.W. Bush, all of us George H.W. Bush guys were like, this guy. But Pat Buchanan started the bleeding with 41. And that bleeding led to Russ Perot getting in the race. And that led to Bill Clinton winning the race with a plurality of the American vote. And with a narrow electoral college win. So I do think you'll see somebody uh, on the Republican side. I also think you're gonna see a lot more independent leaning or independent candidates mm -hmm. considering this. And a couple of them are actual billionaires who know what they're doing and who aren't incompetent. So we'll see how that plays out, but I think there's certainly an opportunity for a very disruptive election cycle um, with pressures inside the Republican party and outside on the independent side. Well, one billionaire uh, who has used to be a Democrat, then became a Republican, then became an independent, and is now a Democrat again, uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, said Trump might challenge Democrats in court if they win the House. Do you agree? Sure. Look, I think, I think Trump is going to declare this election to be illegitimate. Because remember, projection is his central thing. He's going to come out and say, the Chinese stole the election. It wasn't the Russians, it was the Chinese. They stole it for the Democrats because they love Hillary. Okay, but I, I really think you're going to end up with with a president who tries to delegitimize the election and why he wants to delegitimize the investigations This is a guy who defies the rule of law with every breath. He takes he is petrified of accountability So which is also why by the way, I think the Democrats if they take command of the house mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be day one hour one hair on fire. We will now impeach the evil orange one Death of a thousand cuts. Investigative power is magical. And they can drag this thing out and salt, this, salt the earth around him so much and cause so much political cost, uh, you know, uh, opportunity costs for him that that's, you know, that's part of, that should be part of the strategic landscape of holding him accountable is don't try to jump in and eat the candy first. You know, eat your vegetables, go at it, hammer and tongs, go after the corruption inside this thing. I mean, look, you could do a whole, you could do a Benghazi level investigation just on Jared Kushner and MBS in Saudi. I mean, you could, you could, you could spend a year on that and make Jared sit in the chair under the hot lights over and over again as he sweats. Uh, someone asks, how does this end? What are the signs? Serious people have warned, but no one seems to listen and no discussion about what the final straw might be. Um, so a cry of 
despair from the audience. Yeah, well, how does it end? So you saw Mad Max, right? <laughs> the guy in the red jumpsuit with the flaming guitar? Yeah, now that's kind of how it ends. Um, uh, look, I don't think Trump ever goes easily. I, I think he fights tooth and nail till the last dog dies. I think he's divided the country so profoundly that we're going to have to have almost something on the order of truth and reconciliation uh, at the end of this. Almost on the order of some sort of national moment where we really, really consider the damage that's been done and where, we, where, where both sides have to examine you know, how we're going to play this ball game. You're a hard-nosed political strategist. Mm -hmm. You know the game. You know the good and the bad, the seamy, the, the bright, sunny shot side of it. Um, say Trump either doesn't choose to run or he's defeated in 2020, he retires, he marries someone else, I don't, whatever. He's gone. And, and the, the point scenario is, I like to think of is just finishing off a bucket of KFC with gravy. <laughs> and he goes out like Elvis. <laughs> But he's shown that this populist, nationalist, sure. uh, and racist uh, group exists there. Why do you think Ted Cruz has continued after Donald Trump humiliates him every chance he gets, even, even in the course of his rally yesterday? Because Ted Cruz thinks to himself, hmm, I can be the smart one. I can be Trump with brains. I can do this thing and not be crude and capering. I can be the clever nationalist. A lot of these guys will try to be the, will, will try to adopt Trumpism without being Trump. They will adopt Bannonism without Bannon in the room. Um, I think that that is, a, is very fraught with peril for them. I don't think it works in the end, in the general election cycle, mm -hmm. for two reasons. The first is, people who voted for Donald Trump voted for the character he played on TV. They voted for the guy they saw on The Apprentice for 15 years. Who was that guy? Smart, worldly, dealmaker, billionaire, commanding, competent, knew good people from bad people. What they didn't realize is they were voting for his script writers. They didn't realize they were voting for a, a character he played on TV. So trying to do all the Trumpish things that were backstopped. So all the jackass behavior, all the insults, all the making fun of disabled people and women and immigrants was backstopped by 15 years of public impressions of Trump that he was a competent billionaire businessman. These guys aren't going to have that. The ordinary person who acts like Donald Trump, you throw them out of the bar. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not the people you want to have front and center in your political life. Mm -hmm. So... There's a the nationalist populism in his flavor is self-limiting, I think. Okay. Max Boot, who is going to be here on Thursday to insert a second ad into this. Um, but he uh, recently was talking with Charlie Sykes, another Never Trumper. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said he's realized he's not the conservative he thought he was and that he's certainly not a Republican. Um, but both Sykes and Boot were talking somewhat wistfully about a third, uh, a new party, a more centrist party. And this just gets to, and this is reflected in a number of questions here as well. Um, at what point, are you trying to save the Republican Party? Can it be saved? What, uh, what should happen to the party or to conservatives who want sure. a party sure. they can feel good to be a part of? You know, when I started the book, I, I still felt more optimistic about saving the GOP, about hiving off or preserving or, or, or executing a Dunkirk maneuver to save the party where the parts of it that were about individual liberty and personal freedom and constitutional fealty and respect for the rule of law uh, and free trade and free enterprise could be somehow moved to the side. Somehow we would keep the tablets, you know, until the, uh, until the dark age ended. Mm -hmm. um, I am increasingly skeptical that Republicans will do anything but excuse their behavior. And we'll just we'll just shrug it off and pretend this never happened, um, but you know it's 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 the morning after the strip club and there's a lot of glitter and bad perfume in the air and people aren't going to be able to get away from it. They're not going to be able to just walk away and go up. Oh, that was just a passing fancy. That was just a, a fad. That that was parachute pants. I'm not I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> and. 
so I think it's it, it's increasingly difficult to save the the Republican Party brand itself because it's become so infused with Trumpism. Mm -hmm. I do think there is still merit for political programs and platforms that are about those things that I've described. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you get there while Trump is still on the stage. So, you know, again, the, the, Dun the idea of Dunkirk is one that was sort of obsessing me during this whole 2015, 2016 window of how do you keep the things that have merit? And frankly, how do you discard some of the things that, that don't work and don't matter? I mean, I got in a huge fight way before all this, a huge fight with Rush Limbaugh in 2014 because I wrote an article basically saying, you know, I haven't cared about who gets married for a long time. I don't think it's the government's business to tell anybody who any two capable, competent adults who they can and can't get married to. That's the power of the state being socially engineering on the right. If it's bad on the left, it's bad on the right. So leave it be. Let people who want to get married get married. And they all lost their damn minds. You know, you're a rhino liberal shill. Oh, you're part of the cocktail party circuit. No, I, I viewed gay marriage as an individual liberty question. So if I can, if I can help build a new party or a new movement that has left the evangelicals who have proven, by the way, that they are unbelievably hypocritical in ways that stretch beyond even what I knew how hypocritical a lot of them were. <laughs> and I talk about this in the book a little bit, by the way. Thank you. I talk about this about in the book a little bit, by the way. There are a lot of evangelicals who will go out and they will blast the hell out of people who have had affairs. And, oh man, there's one of them. He is a busy boy. I mean, he's like the king of Tinder. Um, and, and there are others who blast gay marriage and, have, and, have, you know, and are on the down low. And so uh, their, hypocr their hypocritical nature was always kind of grating to the fiscal and national security guys like me and the individual liberty guys like me. But now, I mean, the, the golden calf in the White House is a demonstrated adulterer a gazillion times over. He's paid for abortions. He supported Planned Parenthood. I mean, this is everything about him is repulsive. But they're like, well, we want our Supreme Court justices so we can't, so, so those gays won't get married and, and destroy our families. I'm sorry. I don't need those guys in my party. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. You know what? If you want to be a conservative, so, a social conservative who believes in the principles of your church, God bless. Go do. Go, go do good work. And you know, I know a lot of evangelicals who do amazing, amazing community service work, who are conservative and who work with the homeless and who work with the disadvantaged and who work with, with at-risk kids. And, and I, I ask them a lot of the time, like, how, how do you reconcile this? How do, you, how do you have this one thing that you support no matter what and you do good works in the community otherwise? What is the, what's the moment there? What's the thing? And it's because they feel inferior and they feel, they feel put upon, they feel like the world is against them and that society has changed around them, and it has. Um, but if, if the price tag for them to maintain their political power is supporting a guy like Donald Trump, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't need you around. You do, do good work, go do your thing, but you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, and and, and it's, not, it's not denigrating their religion, it's denigrating their politics. Uh, we're getting short on time. Um, I did want to talk to the king of negative ads here about some famous negative ads. And, and so just maybe briefly, if you could sure. give me your take on, for example, the Lyndon Johnson Daisy Girl ad from 64. What a, what a killer. I mean, what a mo it captured a moment exactly. Um, and and it, it, it clarified exactly what people were worried about with Goldwater. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most stark and simple ads ever made. I thought it was one of the, I mean, you, you look back at it as if you're studying negative ads, that's one where people stopped at the end and went, oh, what? And, you know, took a deep breath. Yeah. Willie Horton, the ad uh, supporting George Bush. In well, when Al Gore made it first, it was, you know, interesting, but it wasn't, I never thought Willie Horton was a great ad. Really? I never thought Willie Horton was, was a well done ad. It didn't communicate all that much very well. Because everybody already recognized in the polling that Mike Dukakis was a Massachusetts liberal. That's all you had to say. So Willie Horton was kind of gilding the lily a bit in terms of that race. Um, yeah, it's overtly racial, but it, it also wasn't 
it, it also wasn't very widely aired or very well done. Okay. Uh, the Swift Boat Veterans against John Kerry in 2004. You know, when you go at somebody's strength, uh, they, they have a lot of trouble going, uh, punching back when you're going at their strength. What's the best negative ad you've ever done? Best negative I've ever done? Uh, I'm going to say it was Daughters in the Roy Moore race. And it was just, it was just a montage of young girls, white background, straight to camera. And it said, what if she was your daughter, your sister? What if she was your little girl? Mm -hmm. What if she was 14 or 15 or 16 or 15 or 14? Would you let him date her, touch her, undress her? You know, Roy Moore did. And, and yeah, it, it, it was, I'm pretty proud of that work. That was not, that was not a bad, that was not a bad piece of work. <laughs> well, I've moved, I moved, I moved the needle with that one. <laughs> well, unfortunately we've reached the point in our program where there's time for one last question. So if Trump departs before 2020 and Michael Pence succeeds him, will the Republican party revert to its previous character to a larger extent? Or not? Uh, I think that, that, if that, if that happens, Mm -hmm. Let's take the KFC scenario, <laughs> please. Um, if that happens, I think you end up with um, Mike Pence as the best case scenario for Mike Pence is he's a caretaker in a time of extraordinary chaos. Because if Trump drops dead tomorrow um, and, and <laughs> I heard you, if Trump drops dead tomorrow, um, Washington blows up. Everything goes off the rails. You know, there are two types of, of cohesive White Houses, good and evil. And the cohesiveness around Trump is all, because they're all a bunch of evil rat <laughs> and they're all fighting with one another. If he goes and Pence became president, um, all those Trump people are going to try to suddenly become his guys. It's going to be, it's going to be the greatest yeah, it's going to be like watching rats in a barrel. It's going to be fantastic. But I think it would be a very chaotic time. I think you would see a lot of people immediately moving to run for president on the Republican side and the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. It would unstop a bunch of political log jams in D.C. Uh, but we would be in a, a period of absolute chaos in the country. Thanks to Rick Wilson, Republican campaign strategist, columnist for the Daily Beast, and author of the new book, Everything Trump Touches Dies. We also thank everyone here in our audience as well as on radio, television, and the internet. We want to remind everyone that copies of Rick's book are available right outside this door for signing right after this program. I'm John Zipper, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Rick? Thank you.